picks in the first round. Was there multiple conversations how we want to get this win to play, to match up with the Knicks? Are you confident in that Knicks? Yeah, we wanted the Knicks match up. Of course, uh, that's the easier team. I mean, that's his thoughts at the end of the day. I mean, we're focused, focused on what we got to do. Um, I think that's that's what podcasts kind of do. They just make sure they get you comfortable, and then people just say shit. So, uh, um, at the end of the day, we're focused on us. Um, whatever comments they have, they have. But um, we're focused on our team. We're focused on um, just getting better every day and getting focused for the Sixers. Already some bulletin board material there for the Knicks from Philly's Paul Reed ahead of game one of Knicks Sixers Saturday, 6 p.m. at the Garden. I'm Ian Begley, SNY's NBA insider. You're here on the putback, our show to talk Knicks, playoffs, NBA, and everything else. We've got two great guests today. First of all, we got the Philadelphia Inquirer's Keith Pompey. Cover the Sixers for a long time. If you want to know about the Sixers, you talk to Keith, you read Keith. We have Brendan Brown, three decades in the NBA as a coach, as a scout, as a broadcaster. They're both here to break it down, and we couldn't be luckier to have these two. Guys, we're going to start off general matchup. What, what did you think about uh, the read comments, Keith, and, and how do you think that played maybe with the Sixers? You know, it, it, actually, I was like, OK, there go Paul Reed again. Um, you know, I, I think some of his teammates are probably like, come on, I'm, I'm going to share something with you. One day they were in the locker room. Right. It was after Dallas. And I asked Paul a question. And then Kyle Lowry was like, "Yo, chill, man, chill. People use this stuff as bulletin board material. And Paul <laughs> and goes, you know what? This is how I feel. And and that's who he is. I think he doesn't mean Respected. anything by it. He just has the truth around it backfires at times. <laughs> Got to respect that. Uh, Brendan, your experience, does this stuff actually become bulletin board material or is it a little bit overblown? Well, I think the season series was a little fractured and the Knicks really – like cream them the first game at Philadelphia, one of the best Nick games of the entire year. But then MB doesn't play the other three. There's a terrible 79 73 game at the Garden. So I don't think there's like a lot of fire in between these two teams with like everybody there. People have been missing. In my experience, unless it's something like seriously directed at an individual player. I don't think this is bulletin board material. I mean, these teams are in the playoffs. It's a good matchup. It's an excellent first round matchup. And I just don't think that a comment by a read like that is going to have a lot of an effect. Yeah, makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, Brendan, I want to start with you just getting into the series. What is your biggest challenge uh, with, for this Nick team going into the, the seven game series against Philly? Well, I sat around all day Tuesday, you know, Philly or Miami, Philly or Miami, and I changed my mind a lot. And what I came up with at the end was Philly's the more talented team than Miami, but there are holes that they bring to the game and they bring to the series that the Knicks can take advantage of. And I think the Knicks offense, in terms of having a lot of opportunities for offensive rebounds, the ability to get out on the break, the ability to score in the paint, and the ability to get to the free throw line, like those four areas, Philadelphia is a little bit soft in in some of those spots. So when you're looking for scoring outside of Brunson, and that happened in that game where the Knicks like blew the Sixers out, a lot of different guys had big games. I think that could be very important here. Now, Keith, Sixers, where do you think their biggest challenge is coming into this thing? You know, I think their biggest challenge is um, – trying to stop Jalen Brunson. You know, I mean, there was a couple games where they played him and they had bigger guys on him and the Knicks were able to switch. And then next thing you know, he was getting them seeking out the matchups that he wanted to. So like you said, you know, like Brendan said, you know, they were able to get shots. I think that, you know, he's a guy, he's going to penetrate, he's going to look to score, but you're going to, they're going to focus so heavily on him that they're going to leave other guys open. If they knock down those shots, I think the Sixers could be, you know, in trouble, at least for that one particular game. But he is the guy. I mean, think about it. I mean, he's been one of the top five scorers. He's one of the top five scorers in the league. I mean, he's been on a tear as of late. And I think number one is you got to try to stop him from scoring and setting up 
teammates. Brendan, well, first of all, I should say this. Brendan has a fantastic, detailed breakdown of the Sixers on SNY.TV. If you want to learn about uh, Philadelphia, what they do, how they do it, be sure to check that out. And Brendan, just in terms of Miami having success with that zone in the play-in, do you see the Knicks going to that at all? I mean, it would be a little bit out of character. Do you see them taking a shot there with zone defense? Well, I, I got to mention one thing right before that. You know, I broke down yeah. the Philadelphia and Orlando game on Friday night, and Embiid was moving around just fine. And I know Keith could speak to that. There was the tweak in the second quarter, but he played in the third quarter and still looked good. So whatever happened from the end of that game to later that night or maybe the next morning, and then they sat him out on Sunday, like he was moving great on Friday night, and then we saw what happened the other night. Now, would the Knicks play zone defense against Philadelphia? Maybe you put something deep in your back pocket if you're having trouble with Maxine Embiid as a two-man tandem or guys like Oubre and uh, Harris are getting involved a little bit more in transition of the flow. But Tibbs generally doesn't do that. But then again, it's the playoffs. Like If you had to play that maybe with the second unit for five or six possessions and that kind of made the game go a little bit different, uh, maybe you do have that in your back pocket. The Sixers ran 10 different patterns the other night against Miami, and only the last one or two were effective in any way, shape, or form. It's going to be interesting to see how Thibodeau approaches it in the chess match between Nick Nurse, Tom Thibodeau, Keith. We're talking about Embiid. You're there every day. You're seeing him every day. Where is he now in terms of conditioning and his ability to – you know, go uh, give you 40-plus minutes uh, throughout a series? You know, it's, it's tough because I don't think he, he, he reached that, that level yet. He was trying to. He was trending in that level. And then all of a sudden, you know, as Brendan said, you know, he, he tweaked his knee. And then all of a sudden, he didn't play in the, in the other game. Now, now, here's the thing about Embiid. It's like as far as where is he? You know, I would have to say that he took a step back. You know, I thought that he was like 90 something percent, 95. He was getting back to just being in condition. But, you know, as of the last game, when you saw the Miami, he didn't have the mobility that he had before. Um, it, it seemed like he didn't have the lift on the shot. Um, I don't know if it was mental or not, like if he was fearful of, uh, you know, re-injuring the knee. But I didn't see the same aggressiveness, aggressiveness that I saw in the previous games before before the injury, before the tweak. So I would have to say Embiid's around 80%, you know what I mean? But, I mean, that's good, I guess, but not for a playoff game, in, in my opinion. Maybe I'm making too much of it, Keith, but even with that bad game that he had most of the game against Miami, he still came up really big late. Um, I think he scored or assisted on 10 points. Late in the fourth, it just swung the game. So, you know, regardless, 80 percent, 75 percent, still, you know, can, can come up in a big moment for Philadelphia. And I think, obviously, the series starts there and swings there. And, Brendan, if you are drawing up ways to defend, you're scheming ways to defend Joel Embiid, you've got the Knicks centers at your disposal, how would you approach it? To be honest with you, and, and many moons ago when I coached in Memphis, which goes back like 18 years, um, there were teams that we played that had very good passing big men. And whether they were at the elbow or they were at the top of the key, which are two places that Embiid usually is, we jammed all passers. And being that Embiid might not have a lot of mobility if he kind of looks like he did against Miami, I would get in his face – and make him put the ball down on the floor because I don't think he can do a lot of that. And I would go that way on him rather than play off him or, or come up with different schemes of five-man situations. I would just say to Hartenstein, whenever he's in the game, you're in the game. You see him go to the bench, you come to the bench. He comes to the table, you go to the table. And you just face guard him and cross face, make him turn, Make him turn one shoulder so one half of the floor is taken away. He's such a great dribble handoff guy because he's big and he has a knack for passing. So he and Maxie and other guys can be really good in two-man games. But I would just pressure him and say, hey, you got to dribble the ball to beat us. 
And he could do that last Friday night against Orlando. He was doing everything against Orlando last Friday night. But now the mobility isn't there. Like, make him put it down. Brendan, you've also mentioned um, in the, the write-ups on SNY.TV that if Embiid is out on the out away from the rim, draws the Knicks big man out, that could that's not the natural uh, positioning the Knicks like to play on defense. How do they how do they defend in that position with a Hardenstein or a Robinson pulled out? Well, you have two distinctive options. Number one, do what I just said. Because if you press up on him and you make all passes hard and he might only have a pass to either wing, that's going to somewhat diffuse some of their offensive sets that they run. The other thing you can do is what the Knicks did to Sabonis the last two times they played Sacramento late in the season. And they played off him and they gapped everything and they went at, you know under everything. So that would be like DiVincenzo and Hart going under on some of their different perimeter guys. And then when the guy slid through the gap, then the big did have the ability to go and close back up again after the dribble handoff maybe didn't happen. So the Knicks have done a little bit of both, and Tom has done a lot of really good individual game plans, I'd say, since the All-Star break. So, you know, we're going to find out in the first quarter what it's all about. Because Embiid has generally been up top. He's generally been the trailer. They do put him in the post a handful of times a game, but he's generally out there. Keith, obviously, and be dealing with that significant knee injury, um, and he he got back on the floor. He worked his way back. And uh, is there anything to like this postseason for him and and motivation for him in terms of coming all the way back from that knee? How do you see? Or how does he see this playoff run in particular with this team? Yeah, there's a lot of motivation because when you think of Joel and B, I mean, you think of a guy who has great regular seasons. And then he's often injured in the playoffs and his numbers go down. And, and you know, it's, it's all about legacy, right? So for if you're Joel, you know, and unfortunately he tweaked his knee, but he wants to come back and he wants to play. He wants to show that he can be a reliable player in the, in the postseason. And and right now, it's, it's, you know, that's what it is. I mean, he, he also talks about, you know, he wants to win a championship. He wants to do all this other stuff. But I think at the end of the day, he wants to shed that label of, yes, you're a great regular season player, but your numbers are on the decline in the postseason and you're often injured in the postseason. Yeah, the, the loser of this series, there's ramifications for that team. The winner of this series, I mean, you look at Milwaukee, Indiana, you know, I, one thing with Giannis Antetokounmpo and the Bucks, there's been reporting that he's out for at least game one. Uh, I think, you know, the Bucks are going to be conservative there on Giannis in terms of just the calf and not wanting to rush him back at all because you put him in a position where he could potentially have a more serious calf injury, Achilles injury. So I think that's how the Bucks are looking at this thing with Giannis, just a conservative approach, not rushing him back. So you may... You know, maybe in Indiana gets through there. Uh, maybe they would even with Giannis if Giannis was healthy. But maybe you're looking at a, a tough Indiana team if you get through this next Sixers series. But let's get back to the here and now. Jalen Brunson, Brendan Brown, you've you watched all these games in detail uh, and you've seen how Philly has approached them in the past. You think they have some good matchups for Brunson. What do you see there in terms of the Sixers defending Jalen? Oh, the first thing to talk about is the Sixers general defensive philosophy. You're talking about a team that is tied for number one in steals. They were sixth in blocks. It's very hard to be in the top 10 of those two categories without a lot of activity and a lot of activity in general on the perimeter. Now, if you go to the individual games in this 3-1 Knicks 1 series in the regular season, I think you can put too much stock into what happened down in Philadelphia when the Knicks blew them out. And I think you can put too much stock into the 79-73 game where Brunson went 6 for 22. But are there little bits and pieces of those games that make sense? Kelly Oubre is a pretty good matchup for Brunson. We've talked about it before on these podcasts. Just putting a bigger guy on Brunson does not mean the bigger guy is going to shut him down. That is not true. His footwork is excellent. He'll still figure out how to get high percentage shots. But Oubre is a little different because he's long. He's got quick feet. 
you know, to shift around as Brunson shifts around. And then he's got a little bit of an edge to him. I wouldn't say it's like Dylan Brooks, like nasty, nasty edge. But Oubre does have an edge. So I think he would welcome the matchup. You know, how much he can slow him down, I'm not sure. But he's a pretty good individual matchup, whereas many of the bad teams the Knicks played, you know, at the bottom of the East, they just didn't have schemes or matchups for Brunson, and he killed them. So, yeah, there are other people. Melton, Lowry. Uh, you could throw Maxi at him a little bit. You saw Batum at the end of the game against Miami covering Butler, covering Hero. So he's another potential guy. So then it comes down to Nick Nurse. Am I going to try to play Brunson straight up or am I going to junk the game up? It's Yeah, it's just a chess match, and it's going to be so fascinating to see how it unfolds. Brunson, for you, Keith, and, and you know, you're around the Sixers, what, what are they saying about defending Jalen, facing Jalen over the course of this series? I mean, basically, what, what Brendan just said, I mean, you know, you want a long guy on him, but you want a guy that can defend. And and the thing is, there's two guys, like you talked about Kelly Oubre, but then also I think that, you know, I would bring in Nico Batoon and try to see what he can do with him. I mean, these are two long defenders who, who you know, can defend and they have reach and everything like that. Um, but, it, but again, it, it's one of those things where when you look at him, you know, he is the head of the snake. Like, he's the guy that when, you know, the one game, the second game, he didn't shoot the ball particularly well, and the other guys didn't shoot it. I think that if you go in there and you want to stop him, and then everything else goes. But, yeah, I, I think that you want to get a, a guy like Kelly Oubre, but you hope that Kelly, like you said, Kelly has an edge, but you hope that Kelly doesn't cross <laughs> that edge or do anything crazy, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? You don't want that to happen. But but I think that you need Kelly Oubre and and um and Nico, but you don't you hope and pray that they don't do any switches to where they get Maxi on them. I love Maxi, a great offensive player, but but I think that that's the favorable matchup. Even Kyle Lowry, I uh, hate to say it, but at the age of 38 right now, I think those are favorable matchups for Brunton and where he would, you know, feast on the Sixers, but I like Kelly and I like Nico. Brendan, just, I want to go back to Embiid for a second because you, we talked about Hartenstein. What role do you think of Mitchell Robinson could play uh, over the course of a, a seven game series on Embiid? Well, I think it depends. Like as Tom Thibodeau always said, you go how the game goes and how is Philadelphia utilizing them? And right now, kind of in the games he played heading down into the series, he's on the perimeter like 80 to 85% of the time. So would you, if you were the Knicks, potentially play a Chua against him if he's really perimeter and not play Mitch? You know, like that is a possibility here, depending on how you think the game is going and what you see. Now, if Mitch is out there against him, uh, now what's your immediate strategy on him? Are you up on him? Are you one length with him? Are you playing back on him? What are you doing? But what I would do is I would jam him and make him have to put the ball on the floor. Now, Mitch, we know since coming back, has just had some like limited you know, contributions here and there. In the big Milwaukee win, he did have a couple of big blocks in that run at the beginning of the fourth quarter. But you're constantly looking at Mitch and saying, like, how good a shape are you in? And maybe Achua could be the guy because you want to play 94-foot offense and maybe outrun MB down the floor, and Achua would be better for that. So I think that's something that Tom and his staff will figure out uh, as the games move along. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be fun to see how it unfold Saturday, game one, obviously, and then how the series goes from there. But remember, guys, the putback is also in podcast form now, so you can find us wherever you download your podcasts. Be sure to check us out there or check us out on all of SNY's social media pages. Let's get to OG Ananobi because uh, he, he is one of the many – swing potential swing players in this series now i think with nick nurse obviously keith he knows in and ob very well you think that gives nurse any kind of an edge here in, in terms of uh you know game planning for in and ob and maybe how to approach the way he plays defense 
You know, I think it does, um, but but I also think more so on the when well, when how the Sixers play defense against him. You know, the one thing that I noticed is that you know when when Nick was when when they were in Toronto, it was one of those things from what I heard. Like OG wanted to do a lot more. You know what I mean of the offense in regards to what his role was, and Nick was like, no. This is what you are. You do this, you do that. So I think when you have a coach like that that knows a guy's strengths and his weaknesses, it's going to help the Sixers out, right? Now, defensively, it could give him a little bit of an edge in regards to, like, you know, basically, you know, where he doesn't like to be, how to draw fouls, things like that. But, you know, I also think that it also goes both ways, right? Because then a player often, you know, you you coach for this guy, coach you. Right. You you felt like you were more of an offensive player than your role allowed you to be. And sometimes you go out there and you get motivated to try to show him that, hey, look, dude, you messed up. You should have given me the ball more than you did. So I think it goes both ways on, on, on that one. You know, so but at the same time, yeah, Nick is going to know how to defend him. But I also think that OG is going to be motivated to prove that um, he's a better offensive player than he was used in Toronto. Yeah, big series for Ananobi, obviously a uh, potential pending free agent. And this is probably a conversation for another day. But, you know, I, I've been told that Philadelphia, you know, if they don't, if they are not successful in their pursuit of Paul George, I think Ananobi is right there on their radar. And obviously the Knicks uh, planning on re-signing him, want to re-sign him. That's what happens when you make the kind of trade that you do to bring Ananobi in. You're going to keep him in your building long term. But I think Philadelphia will be lurking, depending on what happens with the Paul George situation. But again, something to discuss uh, another day there, hopefully with Keith, and and uh, we'll see how it shakes out. But Brendan, for you, back to the series here, Ananobi, how would you employ him defensively uh, against the Sixers, and, and what do you think the Knicks can do to put him in the best position to make a, a strong impact on defense? Well, the last time these two teams uh, met in New York, all right, we're coming off the 79-73 game, which was a real rough game to watch both ways in terms of the offense. But the Sixers did get a win without Maxi and without Embiid on the Knicks floor. You can't undersell that a little bit. But that very next game was the first game that Maxi came back from concussion protocol. And the Knicks used DiVincenzo against Maxi in the initial matchups. And I thought he did an incredible job of not allowing Maxi to get the ball back if he gave it up. He pushed Maxi off the three-point line. I know it was his first game back. Might have been a little tentative with that, but DiVincenzo's activity on him was awesome. So then where is Ananobi in that game? Well, Ananobi ended up being on Harris. We know that Harris only has scored 25 points in the four games against the Knicks this year. So OG obviously did a good job in that game. So you say, like, can he guard Embiid in some spots? Yeah, he probably can, especially if Embiid's going to be camped out at the top of the key or, you know, outside of three the whole game. Can he take turns on Maxi? I would say yes. But the one negative that came out of the huge blowout in Philadelphia is that OG tried to guard Maxi a fair amount that game, and Maxi got around him relatively easy and was in the lane three, four, five times. Maxie's one of the only guys in that game who had a good game for Philadelphia. So, yeah, you can throw him at Maxie, but I would like my chances maybe first with DiVincenzo and Hart. I would go that way and then maybe McBride off the bench. Um, But, you know, OG can pretty much guard anyone. So let's see what Tom does with him. Now we've got a question from... Matt Spenley, uh, social media executive. I can't even come up with a new title at this point. Uh, Social media executive for SNY. Now, Matt, you got a fan question for us. What do you have? It's all right, Ian. I'll forgive you. It's all right. But (laughs) next time, you better have a new one. All right? I'm going to bring the heat next time. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Um, So Jace Rawls in YouTube, and we're also seeing questions from our guy, uh, David Futternick, about the role players in the series, who we expect. I know, Brendan, you just kind of talked about it. So I want to talk about the Sixers side here. Keith, obviously, uh, Nick Batum was huge for the Sixers in their in their win against the Heat. So who are the role players for Philly that you anticipate potentially swinging the series? Well, Nick Batum could be one, but, you know, he he shot phenomenal that game. But you're not going to ask him to do make six threes every, every game. I think the guy who was talking to trash – 
could have a big could swing the series, right? And and I'm talking about Paul Reed. And the reason being is, you know, we don't know what how Joel is going to perform, right? Because of that knee. And Paul Reed is a guy who's got a lot of minutes, you know, playing the five spot with Joel being out. And, you know, what they like for him to do is bring some energy and do certain things and play hard and, and run rim to rim. So he can do that. Now, another guy who I feel like could have a big impact is Buddy Hill if he makes shots, right? The reason why I got Buddy is for the playoffs because they felt like he could help create space for Embiid and Tyrese Maxey, and they could probably utilize him a little bit like they did J.J. Redick, like they did Seth Curry, you know, players like that. So those are two guys that I look at as far as coming off the bench who can have a, a big impact. Now, of course, they want Kelly Oubre to do it on both sides of the ball. But if we're talking about bench players, I think that with Joel Embiid's health right now, you got to look at Paul Reed and and then you got to look at, um, you know, Buddy Hill in regards to shooting and, and, and spacing the floor. And Brendan, I'm curious because we were talking about Maxi a little bit earlier. And uh, now we're talking about X factors. Uh, for me, Dante DiVincenzo is my X factor coming into the series because so much attention is going to be paid to Jalen Brunson. Uh, can DiVincenzo take advantage of that? And I, I think that he'll spend some time on Tyrese Maxey, defending Tyrese Maxey. Is that how you see the Knicks matching up early, initially on Maxey? And what do you what do you think about how they would approach Maxey? Well, if they did what they did in the last game and it was a very successful game, yes, Steven Chenzo was on Maxi in that matchup. And whether he was on the ball, but more so off the ball, he would not allow Maxi to get the ball back. Not on a pass to the wing. He chased him really hard into dribble handoffs. He made life very difficult for him. Now, how do the Knicks guard Maxi and pick and rolls? And that's a big key. Keith watches them every night. Maxie's kind of like, this is going to sound unusual, a little bit of a rhythmic pick and roll player. So if he's feeling good in the game, maybe he got an easy basket or two on the break, or he got an open look in the half court, then his game will accelerate very, very quickly in pick and rolls. He's not afraid to shoot all the way behind everybody if he's feeling good. If you go at him, try to show or trap, he can split the trap. Uh, if you go under, he does different things he does, uh, which are effective. But the best is he'll go screen, re-screen, and now you're dealing with him trying to turn the corner off the second screen. So as much as the individual matchup is important with Maxi, how they deal with him in different pick and rolls, whether that's side, elbow, high, they run staggered pick and roll at the top. There's so many different things they can do with him. But as a team defense component, that might be more important on Maxi than it even is an Embiid. I think on Embiid, you're trying to go as one-on-one -on -one as possible. Maxi might be more of a group effort. Yeah, I mean, and listen, you're listening to Brendan Brown break things down in, in great detail, and he's got also fantastic breakdown on SNY.com of the Sixers, so be sure to check that out. Right now, we go back to Matt Spenley, another fan question. What's up, fellas? I'm back. All right, so this one's on uh, how the series will be officiated because this was a bit of a discussion yesterday as A. Hartenstein at practice. I'll read just a brief uh, quote from him. He said about Joel Embiid, he's going to seek fouls, so that's the main thing. Through fouls, he'll get his little breaks, easy free throws. So the main focus is not letting it to the line. He's the MVP, so he's going to get some calls that maybe don't go in your favor. And he made a point to say it's smart for him, Embiid, to do this, um, to potentially utilize this strategy. But Keith, watching the Sixers all year, Embiid, how he's officiated, how do you anticipate that um, going into this series potentially being a factor? Uh, I think it's going to be a huge factor. I mean, he is, and 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 the, and the guy is right. <laughs> That's when Joel takes his break. I mean, he he knows that he admits that. Like, I get to the foul line is a little break. I get to uh, get to shoot the foul shots. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that. I mean, let's let let's face it. Joel he does that move, to, um, and and he gets he gets to the foul line. He is the MVP. He gets a lot of calls, and I expect him to live at it. I mean, the last game, he didn't shoot the ball particularly well from the field, but he was 9 for 10 from the foul line. I think that we'll see that in this series. Now, the one thing is, I noticed that a lot of guys who are real disciplined, who don't get their hands up um, in there, they just keep them up. 
you know, a lot of times when you do that with Embiid, he likes, he, he it rips through, but then all of a sudden it's like, oh, no one's there. And he doesn't, he gets a little, not frustrated, but it's like one of those things where he can't go to that move. But there's going to be times when guys get tired, guys don't think, and they're going to do it, and he's going to bait you, and he's going to get to the foul line. I expect Embiid to live at the foul line. Now, the one thing that Brendan did say, though, right, is here's a, here's the thing with Embiid. If Embiid settles and wants to be at the three-point line and is trying to take these little set shots and all this other stuff, and he's not down, like, facing the basket, like, you know, at the elbow or anywhere like that, I don't think he's going to get as many foul calls. Right. He needs to be physical with it. He needs to be a little bit aggressive to do it. But if he's doing like these bailout shots, they won't get the call. I, I don't think he'll get as many calls as he would like to get. So, Brendan, um, in the clutch and be delivered in the clutch the other night against Miami clutch numbers. When you look at them, how do you assess them going into the series? I tell you what, this could be a very important number. We we know that this matchup, even on paper, is relatively close. You know, who can execute better? Can the Knicks make it a little bit more of an up-tempo game, put the pressure on MB to change ends? But when it comes to the end of the game, okay, the Knicks were 17 and 16 in clutch games, Philadelphia 18 and 18. I thought the Knicks were done playing clutch games, and then they had two more over last weekend to get to 50 games. <laughs> the Knicks... As a team, in the clutch, field goal percentage, 44%, which is just 18th in the league. Three-point percentage in the clutch, 26%. That is 26th in the league. Free throw percentage in the clutch for the Knicks, 69.9. That is 28%. What does that tell you? Maybe Brunson misses a fair amount of free throws at the end of games, or other guys do as well. Uh, the rebounding for the Knicks, just 10th, where they are always number one, two, or three in the league during the game, uh, a, a solid number at 10th. Now, you start thinking about this, and when you get to individual players, Hart and Hartenstein are very good shooting in the clutch. OG is at 38%, Brunson at 42%. Remember with the clutch, you got to add five, so Brunson's 42 is really like 47. But then what? You got McBride at 33. You got DiVincenzo at 30. You got Bogdanovich at 29. And then if Burks were to play, he was at only at 26 this year. So all your knockdown shooters and all your three-point shooters for the Knicks in 33 clutch games, they didn't make many threes or barely any threes. And is Brunson delivering any kickout passes with good efficiency so these guys can knock down shots? And when you think that McBride and DiVincenzo and Bogdanovich could all be on the floor late in games, that could be a very good key, big key in this series in each individual game. I saw Spenley get fired up when you mentioned McBride, Brendan, but we'll, we'll leave that for, for another show. Uh, we talked about <laughs> potentially winning the series and you get through and maybe you have a Milwaukee team that's being very conservative with Giannis Antetokounmpo's injury. Maybe you have Indiana. Real quick, Keith, ramifications for the Sixers if they lose this series, how do you think they'd react? Well, I mean, it, uh, it's, it's weird because you know, they had a rough season, right? They've been through a lot. Uh, I, I think if they lose this series, they'll look at it like this is just another year. I mean, unfortunately, you know, a lot of it would be, um, you know, Joel Embiid's knee, like how, you know, how was he able to play? But then after that, I think that this will, of course, this is going to be the end of, what we see. I, I think that, you know, the Sixers the, this summer, they're going to be disappointed. But moving forward, I mean, the only two guys that will probably be on the team is going to be Maxi and, and Joel B. right? Now, again, they have guys that they just signed from the two-way, two-way guys on there, and they'll be, like, trying out for the team, whatever, or, or low-minutes guys. But I think it, it's going to be an end of an era for the Sixers. Now, again, you're going to have MB but they're going to have to go out and get something. I mean, think about this. This this season, this will be a major disappointment because when Nick Nurse was hired in his opening press conference, what he said is, I know what my job is, right? Is get out of the second round. You know, everybody wants to win a championship, but we want to get to the Eastern Conference Finals. And no matter like what happened, at the end of the day, is all about results. And if they lose to the Knicks um, in this series, it will be one of their worst, 
you know, uh, uh, finishes, you know, since uh, since the process, right? Since the process ended. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, they're going to have to go back in there and think about some things. We talked about Paul George. We, they want OG. They want a lot of different guys. But I think that if they go down, this is going to be remembered as a, a extremely disappointing season. Yeah, and it will be a big off season for Daryl Bore and the group because you guys will have a lot of cap space. I should say the Sixers should, will have a lot of cap space. I really think the off season starts in some ways with Paul George extending with the Clippers, looking elsewhere, somewhere like Philadelphia or another team. And, uh, yeah, just fascinating ramifications. Real quick, ramifications for the Knicks. I think there will be a lot of noise about them not getting back to the second round, not meeting expectations, and un- invariably you're going to point to the head coach m- regardless of how things play out in a series when you lose. I-, I don't see Tom Thibodeau's job being in jeopardy, though, if they lose this series. I mean, if they're non-competitive, maybe we're, we're having a different conversation, but read Jalen Brunson's Players' Tribune essay that he wrote and read what he wrote about Tom Thibodeau. That tells you, All you need to know about how Brunson feels about Thibodeau uh, when your top player is in lockstep with your head coach, the head coach is going to be safe. And also, Leon Rose, uh, I have a very close relationship with Thibodeau. Thibodeau has done a great job in New York. Rose has had the green light to make a coaching change over the past few years, hasn't done it, has stuck with Thibodeau. So I would not anticipate a coaching change uh, unless there's disastrous results for the Knicks in this series even if they lose it. Um, But let's go to prediction. Let me say this. If there was a coaching change, I think it would have to come from above Leon Rose. It would come from the ownership level. But anyway, uh, not a a conversation we need to have necessarily right now. I want to know predictions for this series. Brendan Brown, who's winning it? How many games? A couple of facts you want to talk about when you're trying to figure out the series. A lot of fans running around. Two seed, two seed, two seed, two seed. Yeah. Okay. The Knicks won three more games than Philadelphia, and Embiid missed 43 games. So if Brunson missed 43 games, would the Knicks even be the seventh seed? So mm-hmm. you got to take all of this into when you're trying to figure this out. The fact that Embiid is compromised is definitely an advantage to the Knicks and something that they can take advantage of in several different ways. And I think that Tom and his staff will figure that sort of situation out. I see, as I look at it on paper and what I've broken down on film, that if the Knicks take advantage of what I talked about earlier, there are four different ways they can score. That will get them to 105 in most of these games. If the Knicks score 105 in the playoffs, I believe they're going to win pretty much every game in that, you know, in that manner. So for this series, I see the Knicks winning. I could see it going very long. I could even see it going seven games. If Embiid was 100% or like Keith said, like 85, 90%, I think this is a lot different. But that injury, I'm not going to chalk everything up to that. But the Knicks outside of Brunson, you still got to figure how you're getting to 105. If Brunson gets 30, how do you get the other 75 points? And DiVincenzo is not going to get 15 threes off. And and then you're going to have to have some guys do some more scoring that they usually do. So it will be very interesting. Um, And and I think it's going to be a great series. I I think there could be a lot of theater involved. Keith, I know you have to go cover Sixers practice here momentarily. What is your prediction? Who's winning in how many games? You know, I, I think it's going to be a long series, but I, I think, you know, just by basing off of seeing MB play Wednesday night, I'm not optimistic for the 76ers because, you know, the longer you play, more injury, you're going to have the stress on that knee. I see the Knicks winning this in, in either six or seven games, right? And if it comes down to a game seven, I just think that it's going to be tough for the Sixers to go into New York, go into the garden and pull out a victory. Now, again, if Embiid was healthy, like I, I get it. I, I feel like the Sixers will have the upper hand, but I just feel like, you know, the 76ers, like you're right. This team made the playoffs and Embiid missed a lot of games, but they lose a lot. Their offense is predicated a lot on Embiid and Maxi. And when Embiid is not playing or if if he's limited, teams guard Maxi different in the fourth quarter. 
And I don't know, he can score a lot of points, but I don't know if in, in this setting, if Embiid is hampered, that Maxi is going to be able to get it done by himself. Yeah, I'm with both you guys. I think the Embiid health is a big factor. I think the Knicks in seven, that's where I'm going. We'll see how it starts to unfold Saturday, 6 p.m., Madison Square Garden, game one. That'll do it for us here on the putback. Brendan Brown, Keith Pompey, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your time. And we will be back on the putback sometime after game two, I believe Wednesday. So keep an eye out for us there and keep an eye on Honda Sports Night for your nightly Knicks coverage.